the man who takes on wild crocodiles in the Orinoco River. A lifesaver with attitude off the treacherous coast of Wales. And a South African diamond hunter in deep water. But which job offers rewards to die for? long with 68 stiletto teeth. How close would you get? Listed by CITES as critically endangered, these giant crocs have one last stronghold in Venezuela. And they have a guardian angel, Carlos Chavez. To be a crocodile conservationist means doing a highly dangerous job on low pay less than 5,000 euros a year. Expect antisocial hours, early starts, plenty of night shifts. And you'll be working in a country where hundreds of people die from snake bites every year. The upside? Job satisfaction helping to revive a species that dropped to the brink of extinction in the 1990s. And if you are like Carlos, you also get to be your own boss. Since 1986, he's managed this 3,000 hectare ranch to breed and release new Orinoco crops into the wild. This is where a new generation of conservationists and vets train for the front line. You might have studied the fact file on Crocodilus intermedius, but sitting just metres from two of South America's largest predators is a wake-up call. It's an important milestone, learning to control your fear. The crocodile kindly demonstrates its instinct to strike at any prey that ventures to the riverbank to drink. Carlos is on night watch. Anyone who works with a dangerous creature needs to get inside the animal's head. Know their psychology, and you greatly enhance your odds of survival. Plus, you maximize your chances of seeing some spectacular behavior. You can see crocodiles much better at night. In the beam of a torch, their eyes reflect back in flashes of red. There are very few accounts of these crocodiles attacking humans. Stay on the boat, and you won't be eaten. But they are watching, and with retinas covered with a high density of rod cells, the crocs see you perfectly well in the dark, and in colour. Nasu's a small caiman, ideal for his current study. This is no circus stunt. It's the sharp end of science, and it bites. His student, Paloma, may be nervous, but it's a chance to learn firsthand the difference between crocodiles and caimans. Okay. Paloma, look at this. A caiman has its fourth tooth hidden in the jaw, whereas a crocodile shows all its teeth. They will only handle the animal for a few minutes, so it doesn't get stressed. This caiman has a rounded snout, but an Orinoco crocodile has a muzzle which tapers to a point. A caiman has a high skull. A crocodile has a flat one. A crocodile's jaws are capable of producing 16 tons of crushing force. 
Carlos knows what he's doing. After an eight hour night shift, daybreak brings relief and the softer side of the job. Collecting eggs for the captive breeding project. Still risky though. Did the mother crocodile just leave the eggs here in the sand? Does she leave them all alone or will she still be nearby? She'll probably watch over the nest and is probably down here in the swamp. But don't worry, I can see from here she's coming. This female Orinoco can lay up to 70 eggs. But lizards and vultures raid the nests, so Carlos takes some of them back to the sanctuary. After about 70 days in the incubator, babies will hatch. Now for the conservationists to play God and control the baby's sex. Incubate above 31 degrees Celsius and you'll get mostly males. Below 30.5 degrees and you'll hatch females. This baby's fate may be in human hands, but it's programmed to survive. Even in captivity, young crocodiles show how feisty they are. This eight months old croc will soon have to put the skills it was born with to use in the wild. The young crocs are blindfolded for transport, otherwise they get too excited. They'd fight and easily hurt each other. Thirty down, 150 to go. It's a three kilometer trip for Carlos and his precious cargo to the Orinoco River. With as few as 250 left in the wild, every animal he can successfully reintroduce is a bonus. Be careful with it, Paloma. Push the skull a little bit down before you release the crocodile. Yeah, just like that. Now the last one is free. This is the ultimate payback for Carlos. After 20 years, a lifetime dedicated to his trade. But the emotional high isn't enough for everyone. And with dangers involved, most people want danger money. Money to see, touch, spend. Later, we head to South Africa, where men risk death every day for diamonds. But first... Research proves that the sea is one of the most dangerous workplaces on the planet. Killer waves and little access to emergency medical care make these trades very high risk. So, how does an island nation like the United Kingdom keep its seafarers safe? The answer, recruit highly motivated people working to detect and avert disaster. The Royal National Lifeboat Institute, or RNL, offers a new option. You think you're tough enough? Aileen Jones is a helmsman. She's trained for 10 years, and incredibly, she does it for free. I do it just because I love the sea, basically. It's been my life, and uh, it's been my greatest ambition to become a crew member, and I just absolutely thoroughly enjoy it. Destination, Porthcawl, Wales. Known for its treacherous sandbanks, which have claimed hundreds of lives and counting. 
his voluntary crews must provide a 24-hour rescue service. Think this is for you? Take a look at the full spec. First, you need to know how to maintain a boat. Stripping down the outboard motor, rinsing off corrosive salt water for starters. Next, it's back to school to learn about shifting sandbanks and changing sea conditions. Oh, and are you willing to give up your evenings and weekends to train? Aileen balances all these pressures against her day job in a nursery school. What we do is a dangerous job, but um, the adrenaline kicks in and you don't really think about it at the time. To be part of the six and a half thousand rescue missions launched every year, often in gales of over 30 kilometers an hour, you need the right attitude. Well, to be a helm, you have to have the management skills, really, be able to manage your crew um, and be able to make um, important decisions, basically. Every year, crews like this help save around 6,000 lives. Aileen's crew patrols 25 kilometres of the most deadly waters closest to shore. Boat, so obviously we do all the inshore calls. The RNLI spends half its time rescuing amateur sailors in leisure craft. But sometimes even experienced seafarers risk death. Aileen recalls her most dangerous mission. It was about quarter past 11 in the morning, the seas were quite rough. We got paged. It takes less than 10 minutes for crew members to get to the lifeboat station and get kitted up. The sea is too rough, the boat can't launch. So the final decision rests with... Philip Misson, Volunteer Lifeboat Operations Manager. I give permission for the boat to launch or not to launch. It's a horrible job sometimes. Especially if you know somebody's in trouble out there and you, you won't let the lifeboat launch. It can be quite worrying sometimes. But this time, it's, it's go. About a mile east of the West Ash Boy. There's two people on board. She's hitting the bottom. In big trouble. Right, OK. This emergency has gone down in the annals of RNLI history. A fishing boat called the Gower Pride is stuck on a sandbank. The boat could capsize. In low visibility, Aileen heads out to sea at the lifeboat's top speed of 32 knots. When they arrive, the fishing boat has lost power. And despite the skipper putting down three anchors, the current is just too strong. With the fishing vessel keeling wildly, the lifeboat could get ripped or trapped. Rough to get anybody on board. He tied the rope on himself. Unfortunately, it broke due to the sea conditions, really. With a three metre swell and poor visibility, Aileen must make a decision fast. She can't buckle under pressure. She tries to get one of her rescue crew on board. It's a good call, and they attach a rope. The fishing boat is too heavy for towing to shore. Aileen radios for a larger all-weather lifeboat, stationed at Mumbles, just down the coast. After 20 minutes, the fishing boat is in deeper water. Aileen can hand over to the bigger lifeboat. accomplished and a bravery medal for Aileen. 
if Aileen hadn't got and got to him when they did and get a line on him and hold him off that sandbank until the mumbles had arrived, they, there'd have been no hope for him. It was a wonderful bit of seamanship. It was absolutely wonderful what they did that day. To hold that boat off there in those conditions until the mumbles like boat turned up was wonderful. Just went back home then, had some lunch. Aileen was awarded a bronze medal for gallantry. She may play it down, but as one of only 20 women to receive this honour, it's a fantastic reward. And the spirit of this rough trade seems to run in her family. Well, firstly, my sister's uh, the local auxiliary coast guard, and her two sons are on the crew as well. Uh, my husband's on the crew, and so is my daughter now. Francis is just joining the crew, yes. She's starting a very long process. Basically, because my mum and my dad, they've been around sea all their life, and so have I. So I just really enjoy it. So far, on this stretch of the Welsh coast, a 1,000 people have been saved, but 18 lifeboat crew have been lost. If you're willing to risk your life for others and commit 10 years for no pay, step up to the helm of a lifeboat. In our search for a job that gives back more than it takes, try this. The reward is diamonds, but they could cost you your life. On the west coast of South Africa is Port Nolloth and a bunch of tough men who brave freezing Atlantic waters in search of what they call ice. Hugh Edmonds is a diamond diver. He's done 14 years in the field, but in this job, neither your earnings nor your life is guaranteed. I've been involved in the diamond game for about 14 years, so coming down to Port Norris, we came down to look for diamonds in the land, got involved in the sea diamonds, it's just a sort of a natural progression. This is South Africa's Diamond Coast. Port Nolloth lies 85 kilometres south of the Orange River, a great waterway that hides diamonds in tons of sediment, washed down 2,000 kilometres to the estuary. As the river slows, the diamonds are dumped on the bottom of the ocean. Currents and waves then move them down the coast. Diamonds were first discovered in the area in 1925, and the town has never been the same since. All you need is diving gear, a crowbar to shift rocks, and a suction pipe to hoover up gravel to the surface. Prospectors struck it rich overnight. Now, there are at least 200 divers in town at any one time, and plenty of courses on how to learn the tricks of the trade. With each passing year, the stakes get higher. With most of the pickings already found, new prospectors must dive further and deeper. If you're tough enough, the rewards can be knockout. Two men allegedly once sucked up two and a half thousand carats in three days. That's almost one million euros worth. Diamond diving can be a bit like farming. Sometimes there's a good crop, and sometimes you fail. Hugh's success depends on the ocean. The Benguela current that sweeps along the coast turns the water to an icy 14 degrees. Surprisingly, there have been only five recorded fatalities in the last five years. Around 600 kilometers from Shark Alley, there are plenty of great whites about and undercurrents that can rip you out to sea. With 
With all that in mind, it's time to dive. At 30 metres, the shift starts with heavy lifting to expose deposits. With water 800 times more dense than air, this is exhausting work. Divers continually monitor their surface times. Two of Hughes divers have exceeded their time at the bottom. Should they surface too quickly, they could risk decompression sickness. Paralysis, even death are real possibilities. Recompression is usually enough to treat the bends. Divers should resurface slowly, but this exposes them to shark attacks. Other divers continue their search below. The suction pipe sweeps up one tonne of gravel and 80,000 litres of water an hour. Operating this kind of machinery under such conditions is an accident waiting to happen. I've had one close call working in, in a deep gully. We were pumping through four meters of sand. And when I got to the bottom, a couple of rocks got caught in the nozzle. So I put my hand in front to remove the rocks and my hand went up the nozzle. When the suction stopped, the surrounding sand collapsed burying Hugh for three minutes. Luckily, he pulled his hand free and fought his way clear of a watery grave. Yet men like Hugh keep at it because the jackpot's always in sight, and hopefully under the next rock. Once filtered and sorted by size, Deposits are packed into pans that may or may not hide diamonds. The divers must deliver enough gravel to fill up 300 pans a day. You need a sharp eye for this. Raw, uncut stones don't sparkle. It's the glint of the finished product that keeps everyone focused on the job. We've all got the same blood flowing in our veins. If you're willing to put your head under water and slave down there, you, you have a special breed. As the saying goes, you can make your own luck. He's got an awful lot for a diver. He's got the possibility of making a, a heck of a lot of money. And you work fewer days than any other job I know of, which is a plus or a, or a negative. But uh, I, I love it. I think it's tremendous. Working less than six months a year can earn you a share of the eight to 10 million carats of diamonds produced in South Africa every year. If you're an experienced diver and won't be phased by deadly working conditions or irregular earnings, why not try your luck as a diamond diver? Feel good factor you're after, then try saving crocodiles. Saving people may be the ultimate reward for others, but the big money payoff for high risk work goes to the diamond diver. doing a highly dangerous job on low pay. Less than 5,000 euros a year. Expect antisocial hours, early starts, plenty of night shifts. And 
you'll be working in a country where hundreds of people die from snake bites every year. Of conservationists and vets trained for the front line. You might have studied the fact file on Crocodilus intermedius, but sitting just metres from two of South America's largest predators is a wake up call. It's an important milestone learning to control your fear. The crocodile, Carly. Oranoco crocodile, five metres long, with 68 stiletto teeth. How close would you get? Listed by CITES as critically endangered, these giant crocs have one last stronghold in Venezuela. And they have a guardian angel, Carlos Chavez. To be a crocodile co The upside? Job satisfaction, helping to revive a species that dropped to the brink of extinction in the 1990s. And if you are like Carlos, you also get to be your own boss. Since 1986, he's managed this 3,000 hectare ranch to breed and release new Orinoco crops into the wild. This is where a new generation... on wild crocodiles in the Orinoco River. A lifesaver with attitude off the treacherous coast of Wales. And a South African diamond hunter in deep water. But which job offers rewards to die for?